Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Jason Steinhauer. Jason is founder of the History Communication Institute and is also a global fellow with the Wilson Center. He joins us today to talk about his new book, History Disrupted, How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. Jason, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, and I, I said to you when we were preparing to record, now I'll say it to you again on the air, uh, the book is fantastic. I think it's uh, required reading for anyone who cares about not just history, but I say it, it has application to just about any topic. When I was reading it, I could replace the word history with science or with medicine, and much of what you conclude and much of what you put forward applies almost in a one-to-one uh, basis. So fantastic book, and I look forward to digging into it with you today. And what I would like to do is start by asking you sort of the, you know, the sausage-making question. Why did you decide to write the book in the first place? Uh, what were the series of events? What did you observe out there in the in the internet and elsewhere that was happening to history that you felt that this response was necessary? So the idea for this book actually came when I worked at the Library of Congress. And when I worked at the Library of Congress, I worked at a place called the John W. Kluge Center, which is the Scholar Center at the library. Mm -hmm. And one of the scholars that we had in residence while I was there was a gentleman named David Grinspoon. David Grinspoon was our chair in astrobiology, which is the study of life beyond Earth, or actually on Earth and beyond Earth. And David uh, considers himself to be a science communicator as well as a scientist. So he kind of got me interested in this world of science communication and how the sciences have invested resources and uh, fellowships, training, infrastructure to think critically about how science gets communicated and conveyed through various media, and then how science can affect public policy and public conversation. And the more I learned about science communication, the more I felt to myself that history should do the same. There should be something called history communication and that we should be training people who are history communicators. We sort of you know, crit critically analyze how media is changing the way we communicate history and also how it's affecting what we know about history. So a bunch of scholars and I got together and uh, it included some science communicators, some journalists, some activists, we began to think about what history communication could be and what it could look like. We actually developed some coursework. There's a history communication lab now at Wayne State. But the more I thought about this, the more I thought there's really a bigger story here to tell about how the web and social media are affecting the discipline of history, how they're affecting what we know about history, how we learn about history, even changing the very definition of history right before our eyes. So I began taking notes and I began putting scraps on paper. And I kind of felt that like someone eventually would write this book because there's been so much written about how the web has shaped journalism and media and politics, but no one did. So I figured I had to be the one to do it. So I worked on it over the series of years. I finished the first draft in 2019, the second draft in 2020, the last draft in 2021. And now early in 2022, the book is out. And worth the wait, let me say. And the origin story you tell that involves uh, your observations about science communication, uh, the, the Media Studies Center, probably over 10 years ago, did a study about scientists and their ability to communicate through media and found at the time that scientists uh, would bear a lot of the blame for the ineffective way that science was reported because they just weren't good at it. Did you find anything similar about historians? Are, are historians challenged by the requirements to communicate in a modern telecommunications or communications environment? Yeah, it's a good question because that's actually one of the sort of more simplistic answers that I tried to stay away from with the book, right? The more I looked into it, the more I thought about it, the more I kind of realized that there are actually some much bigger headwinds going on here. And to just sort of simply say that, oh, well, historians could just learn how to use Twitter better and everything would be fine. That kind of just seemed like a really overly simplistic answer. And then the more I looked into it, the more I realized that actually isn't the case at all. Um, so what I do in the book is actually set up how I argue there are really very strong and opposing value structures at work when it comes to how human humanities scholars and historians do their work and think about the work and how the web is set up. And actually is that a contrast of styles, that contrast of values that actually creates 
many of the challenges. And, and I go through the book and talk about various case studies where that clash of values sort of play themselves out on various platforms. Yeah, you write, the web does not privilege facts, it privileges getting noticed and signals of attention. So these are diametrically opposed. So, yeah. so how to, so, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, and just to that point, actually, in yeah. so chapter one kind of sets up the book, but chapter two, I think is probably the most important chapter in the book because it really sort of articulates this clash of values, as you said. And so, for example, things like science, journalism, history, humanities scholarship, these are all sort of expert centric modes of communication, right? The expert is sort of at the center of communicative power. And the, the notion is that, that there will be some sort of deference to experts when it comes to that sort of communication landscape. Well, that's not how the web works at all. And so the web is user centric, as I talked about in the book. So this clash of expert centric versus user centric gets played out over a lot of different platforms, whether it be Wikipedia or Twitter or Facebook or even Clubhouse. And that is one of the things that I think historians and, to your point earlier, broader segments of, of uh, the knowledge economy are struggling with because there is this desire to see expertise get risen to the top of the feed, to achieve more visibility, to be given more deference on various platforms, but that's not how the web is set up. Some have de described it as a sibling society where we're all equals. It's just squabbling siblings. There, there's no hierarchy of expertise. And so you've coined the phrase to describe this as e-history. Explain to our viewers what e-history is. Yeah, so in the book, I talk about how there is the there are these opposing value structures at work. Um, one of the other things I talk about is that history is deemed to be sort of intrinsically valuable by those who practice it. In other words, we kind of assume that history is an important thing to have, even if we can't always articulate what that is or clearly explain why that is. Uh, but of course, the web is very much metrics-based and extrinsically valuable, as I say in the book. So you look at things like metrics, like follower graphs, like user numbers and engagement numbers. And that's what determines sort of what is publicly valued information on the web. So what I argue is that because there is this clash of values between history and humanities expertise and the web, it sort of necessitates new forms of communicating history. And e-history sort of steps in to try to solve that problem and bridge that gap. And e-history is basically a form of historical scholarship or history communication that seeks to utilize the, mechan the, the mechanisms of the social web in order to achieve visibility on the web. In other words, the only reason to put something up on the social web and on social media is for it to be visible. Otherwise, there's no reason to put it there, right? So e-history is, is a series of mechanisms by which historical information or information about the past becomes visible online. And it attempts to solve this problem of bridging these value structures, which are seemingly at odds with each other. And so different e-history then tries to get visible in different ways, whether it be through virality or whether it be through visually arresting imagery, or whether it be through crowdsourcing. And so the book then goes on to look at these various case studies where different forms of e-history become visible in different ways or become invisible because they don't adapt to the mechanisms of the web as well as others. Well, and you, you use an example that relates to uh, the, the current weather that we're both sitting here in the D.C. area with snow melting after quite a snowstorm, a surprise snowstorm. In one of the chapters, you talk about the so-called snowzilla, the, the snowstorm that if you just look at snowstorms via the World Wide Web, you'd get the impression that this is one of the most historically significant snowfalls of all time. But that doesn't hold up to the kind of scrutiny that a historian would apply. Right. This is in the chapter on Wikipedia. And one of the things I talk about on Wikipedia is that the crowdsource past cer certainly privileges certain types of information and allows other information to never be seen or never see the light of day. And I talk about in there one story where a historian actually tries to change a Wikipedia entry and he gets denied by the crowd because they say to him that, you know, you're only one voice in the crowd, even though he's a leading expert on the subject. So sort of the crowdsourcing mechanism of Wikipedia actually prevents some accurate information from ever being seen by people. But to your point about the snowstorm, when this massive snowstorm hit in 2016, people were writing a quote unquote history of that snowstorm before it even happened. There was this rush to create the narrative about the thing before the thing even had occurred. And so this is where Wikipedia starts to create 
sort of a new first draft of history, which is not quite journalism. It is not quite scholarship. It's just more about this rush to contribute to the ongoing conversation. And that can lead to a lot of enthusiasm, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a lot of significance. And I think that is one of the distinctions we have to think about when we look at Wikipedia. Is an entry created out of a buzz of enthusiasm for a certain thing, but how does that actually play into larger questions of historical understanding and historical significance? And that's where Wikipedia oftentimes falls short. We've had a lot of discussion about the emergence of the so-called citizen journalists, and now what you're describing are citizen historians, self-assigned. I'm, I'm documenting history, even though I have no credentials or training to do so. Yeah, and listen, I think there's actually something valuable about that. So the book tries to take a nuanced approach to all this without painting easy villains, right? So mm -hmm. there are some things that technology does well. There are other things that I think are very dangerous about technology. Uh, but certainly one thing that professions like science, like journalism, like history have in common is this sort of linear path of credentialism that involves a fair amount of gatekeeping. So you can't do X until you've done Y. You can't be a professional historian until you've gotten the requisite degrees. You can't be a journalist until you've gone to the right programs or interned at the right places or cozied up to the right individuals who are in the right chairs. So I think there is a sort of noble ethos to breaking down some of those gatekeeping mechanisms and quote, lowercase d, democratizing the abilities for people to participate in these forms of knowledge creation. Because as you and I both know, those forms of credentialism and knowledge creation have oftentimes privileged people who look like you and me and have underprivileged other people. So this is not to throw everything under the bus and say that everything that happens online is a travesty and wasn't it better 25 or 30 years ago. But I do think we have to be cognizant of what this landscape of you, uh, universe, as I call it in the book, universe of e-history is that we've all collectively created and recognize it for what it is and also recognize the fact that it actually hasn't done much to improve our understanding of history overall. That's the most, uh, I guess, discouraging aspect of all of this, the, not just what we're talking about today, the larger cultural question of how we've change the way we share knowledge and information via the internet is that the expectation going in was that this amazing access to more and more information would lead to more and more understanding. And what you're telling us is that in many cases, the opposite occurs. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to get your mind around, right? And I think part of it is because we see so much e-history out in the wild, we sort of then assume that, okay, there, there must be some educational value to all this. People must be learning more than they did before just because they see so much of it. And that was sort of one of the assumptions and premises that I went into the book with. But the more I, I interviewed people, the more studies I looked at, the more findings I uncovered, the less convinced I was of that. I really just couldn't find any evidence to support that this preponderance of the history out in the world has actually improved people's understanding of history. It has certainly made people more aware of various things in history. But awareness does not equal understanding, as you and I both know. I'm aware of gravity. I don't understand how it works. And so there's a lot of that when it comes to e-history, right? I'm aware of certain things or certain people that I may not have been aware of before. But that doesn't lead to understanding. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest and I talk about this in the book, that this sort of overwhelming deluge of information that we take in every day just has the effect for most people of making things confusing, confounding, overwhelming, and then leading them to try to make sense of it on their own. And I talked about various anecdotes in the book where individuals who try to make sense of things on their own end up winding down some very, very dark paths, including getting involved with extremist organizations or looking at outlets like Russia Today, for example, and their propaganda channel, and sort of all that stuff gets conflated when you look at it online because it becomes very difficult to tell the difference between a reputable academic or journalistic source and a Russia Today or other disinformation outlet. So it's a, it's a paradox for people like us who want to use the web and social media as a way to educate and inform and deepen understanding, but recognizing that in fact, much of what is out there is not having that effect. Using that example, Jason, of the disinformation or, or, or distortion and then where that can lead, what, 
what's the converse of that? D dive a little deeper into what do historians provide that isn't provided in e-history in terms of things like context or connecting dots or, or not uh, taking the best story because it's the most colorful story and uh, exaggerating it in a, way, in a way that may actually exaggerate or distort your understanding of history. What are the value adds that trained historians bring to the table? Well, the first thing I'd say is it's important to, for me to reiterate that professional historians actually do create e-history. So e-history is not something that is apart from professional history. It's a way to sort of bridge the gap between traditional and social. Right? But it's harder that, to tell what's reliable and what's not. Right, right. And so I would say that for me, the important thing, to, the, one of the important take homes from this book is to recognize that so much of the e-history that we see is a product of a particular place in time and a certain set of conditions. And what I do in the book is I try to walk through how that happens, right? So if you're seeing something in your feed on a particular day, it's probably tied to some sort of news hook or news peg, or it's probably tied to, in the case of the snowpocalypse thing we talked about earlier, some sort of seismic event that is happening that people are rushing to contribute to. And so I think what e-history ends up doing is it becomes more about the present than it does about the past. It becomes more about monopolizing or capitalizing on something that happens to be in public conversation and then trying to peg something in the past that happened to that thing in order to capitalize on the momentum or the visibility of social media. And it becomes less about understanding with fidelity and rigor what may have happened in the past. So I'd say one of the distinctions that historians try to bring to the table, whether they're practicing e-history or they're doing scholarship in the classroom or in, a, or in a library or an archive is to really be focused on understanding with accuracy and fidelity and rigor what happened in the past, regardless of whether it can be pegged to a particular news item or regardless of whether it happens to be trending on social media or regardless of whether it happens to be affecting a particular group of people on the Eastern coast of the United States who happen to have loud megaphones. So I think that's one of the things about e-history that we need to recognize when we're seeing something online about the past, we have to ask ourselves, am I only seeing this because it directly relates to something in the present? It only relates directly to a particular agenda or a particular uh, desire that someone has for me to see this information? And does that actually equate with a deeper understanding of what may have happened in the past? And oftentimes the answer is no. Speaking of rigor, uh, you, you make the point in the book several times about the, the shifting from this user-centric to expert-centric is that the standard becomes good enough knowledge, enough to debate, enough to make a point, but not really rigorous diving deep in a way that creates true understanding. Yeah, and that's kind of the point I was just saying, right? When, when something hits the news or something hits social media, there's this rush to want to contribute. And so actors online, whether they be genuine political actors who are looking to contribute to the conversation or whether they be disinformation agents who are looking to manipulate the conversation, they will grab pieces of e-history from various parts of the universe and throw it into the mix as a way to advance the conversation, to stir things up, to rile up people's emotions, or to advance a particular agenda, whether it be a personal agenda, a commercial agenda, or a financial agenda. And, and I talk about this in a chapter on Instagram, actually, and the visual past. Uh, this oftentimes is supposed to sort of be uh, obvious, like, oh, this clearly uh, explains this point, or this clearly explains this issue. But actually, when you look below the surface, it doesn't really explain anything. What it is, is someone just trying to capitalize on a particular moment in order to gain some visibility online. And so that doesn't always equate to understanding an issue with some depth or complexity. This was an old media problem too, right? It, it, a television was often driven by the visuals. If we didn't have good video to share, that story may have gotten less attention than a story that had spectacular video to, to match it. So, one of the things you talk about, which is really interesting, is about how the election of Donald Trump and how his use of social media actually created an incentive for historians who had not been as fully engaged in the world of Twitter or elsewhere to dive in. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So as I was doing my research on the book, I wanted to know when historians sort of joined Twitter en masse. Um, and it turned out, based on my research, that it was in the years 2015, 2016, and 2017 which not, not coincidentally coincides with the rise of um, candidate and then president 
Trump. And I talk about in the book how for most historians today working in the profession, there is an imperative to make uh, the study of history and the practice of history uh, more diverse, less Eurocentric, more integrative of a variety of narratives. There's a huge emphasis on gender and women's studies, on ethnic studies and indigenous studies, African-American history. Um, and so in some ways, President Trump and his campaign really encapsulated the opposite of that, right? And so he, his brand of conservative politics was viewed even before his election as uh, a real existential threat, not just to the history profession, but to some of these larger values of multiculturalism and pluralism and uh, acceptance and, uh, and diversity in various viewpoints. So what was interesting is to see how Trump used Twitter very effectively in order for him to get elected. And so in response, there was this massive anti-Trump resistance that formed on Twitter and elsewhere that really coalesced various sectors and segments of society who were opposed to Trump and his worldview. And that included historians, particularly historians within academia, but historians writ large, public history included. And so historians began to form alliances with journalists, with activists, with other progressive actors on social media, particularly on Twitter, and join in this anti-Trump resistance. And that actually helped to elevate and lift up several historians' voices. You could think of people like Kevin Cruz at Princeton or Heather Cox Richardson, or even Joanne Freeman, whose Twitter followings really grew and their voices really got amplified during the Trump presidency because they were part of this larger anti-Trump resistance movement. Have they remained in the in the e-history e game post-Trump? Oh yeah, they're still very active on Twitter. Heather Cox Richardson actually has a very wildly successful uh, Substack newsletter, which now I think has over a million readers. Yeah. So, Don't quote uh, me on that figure, it may be off. Okay. <laughs> well, she'll be happy to hear that figure. Yes. <laughs> so so uh, what about your own foray into the world of, of social media and the internet in attempting to, you, uh, you have the, um, the History Club on Clubhouse. Uh, you have your own Twitter feed. Uh, talk about what your own experience has been from the inside out. Yeah, so let's, this is one of the things that I think we all have to wrestle with because in the book, I do try to make the point that we've all been complicit in this social media universe that we've created, uh, which we're now realizing 10 to 15 years after many of these platforms have grown into billion dollar companies, we have a lot of misgivings about. And so we're all responsible. Uh, including myself. I've been on Twitter, I've been on Facebook, I've been on Instagram, I've been on Clubhouse, I have my own cryptocurrency. Like, you know, I'm very much in it, even as much as I try to dissect it critically and analytically. Uh, there, one can make the argument that I have benefited from social media and e history uh, in terms of my own book and my own profile uh, in ways that other historians have not. And so, uh, I think a question now is incumbent upon all of us as we enter sort of a new decade and a new iteration of the web with web 3.0 here um, is what do we do with this world now that we've built, you know, and, and we have to recognize that we've all been complicit in building it. And how do we create a better set of incentives for the web moving forward than the ones that we've just had for the past 20 years. The web, as you said, in its current iteration does not privilege expertise does not privilege accuracy. It privileges first and foremost, visibility and signals of attention. I, after thinking about this and writing about it for several years, I'm convinced that that's a bad set of incentives. So how do we create a better set of incentives moving forward? How do we create a web that does privilege accuracy, that does privilege expertise, that privileges patience and depth and rigor and not breaking things all the time and moving so fast that we destroy some of the institutions that are vital to American democracy. So I would like to think that now with the limited platform that I have, whether it be on Clubhouse or Twitter Center at the, uh, Twitter at the, or the Wilson Center, that we can start to have conversations about designing a better incentive structure for the web moving forward, that Web3 can look different than Web 2.0. And if I can use my platform and the limited influence that I have to help advance those conversations along, then I hope that that can at least be somewhat of my contribution to making a better social media than the one that we've currently experienced. The, the book itself is a fantastic contribution to the discussion. The, you know, so many points, Jason, you made that I, I want to quickly follow up on as we begin to move into our concluding portion of the interview. Uh, 
you're right. Humility should be the history's most important lesson. That, that phrase just really resonates with me in a way that seems completely in opposition to the current culture of sort of narcissism and self-promotion that the web sees. And then also uh, you, you talk about changing web 3.0, building a better mousetrap. But are we talking about the actual design? Are we talking about the uh, the financial incentives, the, the economic structures of this that reward attracting eyeballs over everything else. You know, where, in other words, oh, you also, through your own institute, are talking about education, media literacy, even though you don't use the term media literacy, it's certainly implicit in most of the things that you write in terms of solutions. And sorry for rambling, but what I'm heading toward is this is a heavy lift. And where do you see the, the biggest opportunity for action? Where can the interventions occur that can begin to build that better mousetrap? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a huge and heavy lift. I expect that I'll be spending the rest of my life working on these things and probably still will not get to the place where I wanna to get to. But I think Václav Havel is the one who said about democracy that it's, horizon, it's a horizon, right? You keep running towards it, but you never reach it. So that's kind of how I see this work. Um, I think we need to be having broader conversations with a diverser group of, a more diverse, diverser group of stakeholders at the table when it comes to designing the incentives of the next iteration of the web, right? So I've been arguing, I do have contacts in Silicon Valley and, and other tech companies, and I've been in conversation with them, but I've been arguing to them that as they're developing their products, it can't just be engineers and venture capitalists in the room. I have to have humanities scholars, sociologists, political scientists, people at the Wilson Center at the table, because invariably the engineers and the VCs will only see the best case scenarios for their products. They're gonna imagine the best use cases, but we need people who are gonna be saying, okay, well, but what happens if X or what happens if Y, or did you think about that, what this could lead to if you allow it to happen, right? And I've been in these conversations recently where people are still making some of the same mistakes when it comes to product design and moderation and what goes into the algorithm and how things get weighed. So I'm really, I think that's something we need to work on right away. It's just having a broader group of stakeholders at the table as these technologies are developed before they get out there into the world. Because as we've seen with web 2.0, once they get out into the world, there is this rush to adopt them because everyone doesn't want to miss out. Doesn't want to miss out on the opportunity to build new audience, to miss out on the opportunity to make more money, to raise their own visibility. And so the right incentive structures have to be built into the programs before they hit the market. Then on the other side, I do think that the media literacy piece is critical. I've written about how media literacy and historical literacy are sort of intertwined in our current era, but we really do need to be ensuring that people think critically and skeptically about the stuff they see online before they sort of just digest it as truth or as accepted narrative. And then the last thing I would say, which I talked about a little bit in the book, is that we have one great thing already at our disposal, which is we have really amazing college level history courses that are being taught all across the country that could help people with historical literacy and going deeper and understanding things with more complexity. The problem is that people aren't taking them, right? The, the, the drop in history majors in this country has been precipitous, 33% decline over the past decade. And so we need to make college more affordable. We need to get people back into history classrooms. We need to get them engaging with historians and history professors, because I suspect that one of the challenges we face when it comes to this lack of historical literacy is the fact that most people haven't taken a history class since 11th grade in high school. And if that's what your understanding of history is, I have some shocking news for you. It is probably <laughs> overly simplistic. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, as you, you to paraphrase uh, Václav Havel, you know, as we look to that horizon for something better, your book certainly provides a lot of clarity in how we think about it. So, thanks for spending some time with us today and talking about it. Well, thank you for having me, and I appreciate everything the Wilson Center does, and for giving me an opportunity to be part of the Wilson Center community. It's a great well, it's great having you as part of it. Thank you, Jason Steinhauer is the author. The book is History Disrupted: How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now, and that you'll join us again soon for another. Until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here. <laughs>